and we're recording. Hey everyone, welcome to Functional Programming. Um, it's also probably a good opportunity to talk a little bit about what a programming paradigm is in general. So let's start there. Um, anybody have like either have a good definition, want to hazard a guess at a good definition? Uh, what is a what do I mean by programming paradigm? Functional programming is a programming paradigm. Object-oriented programming is a program paradigm. What does that word mean in this context? Is it like a set of conventions that you try and follow? I love that, set of conventions. Who else can add something to that? Uh, is it somewhat like um, procedural? Uh, procedural is also a paradigm. I watched one of your videos and learned that like um, initially everything was functional, then there was kind of a shift to OOP hmm? and seeing kind of the last five to 10 years. Yeah. A, a little bit to functional. So yeah, like we have a timeline of like what's popular going back to like, oh, let's say 1950, uh, 2020. I would say FP was super popular. And then uh, sometime around the 70s, procedural started getting kind of hot. And then by probably by about 1990, OOP was all the rage. Um, and then I'm gonna say like about five years ago, I started noticing this rapid uptick in interest in, so let's say like 2015 or so, FP started getting a lot of steam. So there is some like trend to this. It's true. There's, um, I've, I've heard, also heard the phrase thrown around parallel programming. How does that fit into the, the timeline and these sure. structures you laid out? Um, functional programming lends itself to parallel computing um, much more so than either of the other paradigms. So you could also say that these trends are heavily driven by our needs in computing. What kinds of problems do we tend to run into? Well, that informs what kinds of solutions we find for them a little bit. Other ideas on what, what I mean by a paradigm? Set of conventions, that's true. So it's a way to classify different languages? Mm -hmm. It is a classification. Um, some languages are multi-paradigm. JavaScript's multi-paradigm. You can do a little bit of everything in it. Um, whereas like Ruby, not really. Ruby's kind of just OOP. Java is sort of just OOP. Haskell is just FP. So we can classify languages by the paradigm that they encourage. Any other thoughts on what a paradigm is? One more thing I'm looking for. I guess the purpose of following a paradigm would be like, because people believe they, they'll they end up with like a better or more consistent predictable end product. Yeah, they totally uh, believe that. They, um, they'll pick one of these things, yeah, because they think that they'll have a better end product. Now, some things that like, all right, well, if there's these different camps, why would, um, like, who's right? How would you even evaluate such a thing? And it comes down to things like, all right, are we programming for extensibility so we can change our minds down the road? 
change our minds in which ways? Uh, are we optimizing for performance? Are we optimizing for things like parallel computing? Can I, uh, am I working with problems that need to be split across a lot of different computers? This is like how supercomputers work. It's not just one computer with a giant fucking <laughs> processor on it. It's a bunch of smaller computers that can work together on something. The reason they can do that is because they can split a problem into smaller pieces and have each little computer work on it, work on a part of it. Um, or like, I don't know, who are you working with? I would say like FP is very mathy. OOP is very like literate. Who's on the team? All those things like come into play when you're evaluating whether or not a paradigm is right for something. So another thing I'd, I'd look for is like principles and values. Sort of goes with conventions, but I've distinguished it a little bit. It's not just patterns that we're following. It's things we believe about how code should work. Uh, so paradigms kind of like encapsulate all of that. So you guys did some OO stuff yesterday. Uh, anybody pick up on the pillars of OOP? We've talked about it a little bit in talking code also. Would that be like Inheritance. encapsulation? Mm. I heard encapsulation. What's encapsulation? The one I have the most trouble with. Um, <laughs> It's like a matter of scope, right? Uh, it's a little bit to do with it. Not, not a part of it, but probably misses the, the major part of encapsulation. I have written down wrapping data and methods together into a single unit or class so you can access state through behavior. Ding, 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 ding. Um, something state and its behavior are ways that we operate on that state always travel together. That's encapsulation. Functional programming believes the exact opposite. Functional programming, we keep our behavior and the data that we're operating on completely separate. That's a perfect example of like a, a split in a paradigm. OO, state and behavior travel together. FP, your behavior operates on state, but it's not packaged together with it. So is that why like when it comes to like classes in JavaScript, it's a lot kind of more loosey goosey. You can like do stuff to break the rules as opposed to Ruby where it's like built from the ground up as OOP. Uh, yeah, JS is, yeah, so they slapped this Oh, like stuff on it, like the class syntax and those kinds of things um, to make OO people happy. They also added a lot of like super functional things like um, like the spread operator. That's very functional. Um, so around and like even with promises. So like those dot then chains, that's that's the functional way to handle that problem. Async await. That's the procedural way to handle that, handle that problem. So like, JS has always played both sides of the fence <laughs> on like paradigm issues, which I would argue can make the language a little bloated, but it's also what makes it so powerful. It's defined as being a functional language, right? It was originally. It's probably closest to that, but we have all these OO features now, so. It's kind of both. Cool. So let me give you an example. I am going to, we're going to look at the same idea in an OO paradigm and a functional paradigm. 
Uh, yesterday, Naya like had some like practice code challenge thing that was like, "Let's write something that squares a number." Let's look at the ways that we can do that. Um, so, if Okay, so let's say I had a class um, called number and uh, it has a constructor that takes in the number you want and says this dot number equals number and then you could do something like square it, which returns uh, this dot number times this dot number. Or you could maybe have like an add that takes in a number and uh, returns this dot number um, plus number. You could also do something like instead of returning it, you could say this dot number equals. So you're just changing the state of it. That's that's pretty OO. So we could say this dot number equals this, um, and then I have like a get number getter that would be like return this dot number. That's like a, all of this super OO. The functional way to do these things have a, a function called add that just works on data. That's the difference. So then our state, our data, lives completely outside of this. Or like that. OO, the state and the things that operate on the state are bundled together. I don't know if you picked up on this, but in Ruby, there are no standalone functions. Even that shit we had you guys doing in like the first week where like you would just write def whatever in the middle of nowhere. Those aren't standalone functions. If you don't declare a class, it's still in a class. It's in a class called main, but it is still owned by a class. Not in JavaScript. We can make functions that are just all by them lonesome. That's a functional idea. Ask me some questions about this. Just got a syntax question. In your function add, doesn't that spread open up that numbers array? And then you're then reducing a non-array, aren't you? Ah, so this is not the spread operator. This is the rest operator. Um, it's the exact same characters, but it actually does something different. So what that does is you'd have something like, If you're doing something like that, it turns uh, all of those into an array. It does like the opposite of a spread, which is kind of confusing. So that's so does it kind of go ahead. So does it kind of toggle the numbers between being an array or not? If it so, is an array, strips them out. 
so like in the way that I'm using it here, this has four arguments. It could also have two arguments or one argument or 17 arguments. Um, so I need to be able to handle a varying number of these things. This lets me collect those into one argument. It's just an array that I can do whatever I want with. Oh, is it kind of like, um, I think like in Ruby and Python, you can use like an asterisk to Correct. declare like multiple or variable numbers of arguments? Okay. Exactly. So that's called a splat in Ruby. This is the same kind of idea. So same same syntax is like what Brian was saying with like uh, deconstructing the array, but just different Correct. if you pass it as an argument. Yep. Uh, rest and spread, those two ideas are called. They do opposite things and they use the exact same operator. <clears throat> I get an error, a syntax error in that function, in the add function. Was the, the add function? Yeah, I don't know why. It says it's expecting a semicolon afterwards. Semicolon? Yeah, I don't know why. Mm -hmm. Also, what, when do you think it's, what, when is it better to, why wouldn't we uh, define all these classes in the back end and instead of the front end? Or when is it better to do it in the front end or in the back end? And so, oh, totally different conversation. Um, the paradigms thing, you can do either paradigm in either place. Um, there, that, that's a bigger question about architecture, but um, you can have functional backends, OO backends, functional frontends, OO frontends. For example, um, uh, Rails, very OO approach to APIs versus something like um, Express or uh, Haskell. That's a very functional approach to backends. Go, Go is the most procedural language I've ever seen. Um, and like also very popular for backends. On the front end, React is generally considered like the captain of the functional approach to the front, to front ends. Uh, Ember is very OOP. Um, so you've got, you've got a range there. So one, three, seven. Works for me, man. I'm getting those squiggly red lines in that function. Uh, are you sure you are running this as JavaScript? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah uh, I just you this. also have this class here, because you can't have a class called number. There's already a thing for it. Just an example. Other questions about the difference between these two things. Yeah, I guess just a clarification is in the, the top one is you can only apply those square methods if you're doing number dot square or something like that. Whereas right. you can you can call these functions on anything on in any a scope. Yeah. Yes, nailed it. Yeah. Um, and so this might be some number equals new number five. And I do things like some number dot add five. So I keep doing these things. I could also square it and then get whatever the result is like that. Other questions about this?
Cool. So what I want to do is um, just like OOP had like those pillars, encapsulation, inheritance, polymorphism, abstraction. Um, the functional ones aren't see, principles of functional programming. These aren't as like well branded <laughs> as the OOP ones, but there are some ideas that we see coming up over and over again. Um, so I want to split y'all into rooms to discuss these. Immutability, discipline state, peer functions, uh, first class and higher order functions, type systems, and referential transparency. Old man Coberly's favorite thing. So uh, let me. So that's six. All right, so we're going to be uh, in groups of two to three. Um, Elliot, Jen, Kyle, you're talking about immutability. Sydney, TJ, you're talking about discipline state. Uh, Brian O and Kelsey, you are talking about uh, peer functions, um, side effects. Uh, Ahmed and Victor, why don't you talk about type systems? And wait, how did I do this wrong? No, nope, uh, sorry, Ahmed and Victor, you're talking about uh, first class functions and higher order functions. Lynn and Sanjeev, you're talking about type systems. Um, and Luis and Shelly, you're talking about referential transparency. Do some research, we're gonna take 10 minutes on this. Uh, do some research, chat with each other, see if you can wrap your heads around this and you're gonna present back to the group. Uh, and then like, don't worry too much about <laughs> making a bulletproof case or anything. I'll help you out if you're a little bit off base. Um, okay, go for it.
I, <laughs> I think we got it and uh, um, Luis is gonna present. I might jump off to study okay. something for a second. All right. Uh, yeah, thanks Luis. Okay. Bye. <clears throat> shoot All right, welcome back everybody. So, can't wait to find out what we learned. Um, all right, so Elliot, Jen, Kyle, we're talking about immutability. What did you find out about immutability? Oops. 
sorry, my computer glitched there. Um, so immutability, it's the uh, inability to change. And then some of the benefits I was reading about it is that um, it allows you to have a mathematical approach to create pure functions, um, which can help evolve, avoid problems with your data and preserve state history. Oh, love it. So the uh, inability read, for, go ahead. I read a little bit about uh, freeze in JavaScript, mm -hmm. allowing you to like superficially give mutability. To change, excellent. So um, you mentioned that this is like, helps us take more of a mathematical approach. Um, yes, expand on that. Um, so what I was reading was talking about how like in math, a number is a number. So it allows you to kind of treat your data and whatever you're writing that same way. Ding, ding, ding. Very good. So if I say that A equals one plus two, I can't right afterwards say that A equals 15. That wouldn't make any sense. We do that all the time in programming though. We're just reassigning a variable. Uh, turns out that concept of like having variables be little containers that we can store stuff in, that was like, uh, it's called the von Neumann style of programming. So it's what procedural programming is. Um, that's not how we treat variables in math. Uh, they're statements of fact. We're saying A equals one plus two. A is three. A is never anything but three. Now, if we do that, if we have that same kind of approach in our programs, there is an entire class of problems that we no longer have. We don't have to know that like something was right at one point in time, but it was wrong at a different point in time. As it turns out, time is the problem. Keeping track of what something is at different points in time, oof. That's the source of like 90% of our programming problems. If we cannot have that problem, our programs get a whole lot easier to work with. Very nice, thank you. Uh, group two, Sydney and TJ, what did you find out about whatever I told you to read about? <laughs> discipline state. Cool, what's discipline state? Um, it, it actually, uh, I actually just read something that really kind of made it click um quite a bit so like it, it's really tied into immutability um basically it's like basically it's it's very encouraging of like a lot of like the things that we've done in refactoring with you and ahmed recently where it's like if you know don't make something a global variable unless you have a really good reason for doing that and you shouldn't be changing the values of variables um unless you're defining them inside of a function, and if you do need to change the value of it, save it as a new variable, basically. Yeah. Because yeah, I can't say a equals one plus two and then a equals 15, but I can say a equals one plus two and b equals one plus 14 or one plus a, that's fair. It's a completely different fact. Excellent, very nice. Um, and that, you nailed it. That's exactly what it is. If we think of like our function scopes as little boxes inside of boxes inside of boxes, functions inside of functions inside of functions, then a, a big part of this is how close to where it's being used can we get something? So if something's being used here, can I define whatever variables I need in there? If something is uh, being used here, can I not define it out here? Can I have a way to get it right next to that instead? That's discipline state. It also made mention that like uh, it it stops you from having to like catch me if you can through like six seven different functions to yes. try to figure out like what is eventually being done with this variable. Um, <laughs> I love that. Catch me if you can. Uh, perfect. Very very well put. Good job, team. Uh, Brian and Kelsey, what did you find out? 
All right. Kelsey, you want to do it? I think you wrote everything down. Right? Um, yeah, sure. So basically, pure functions will not have side effects. So it's not going to change anything external of that function. Mm -hmm. um, it depends only on its own arguments. Um, one thing that I read that kind of made sense was that a dead giveaway, if a function is impure, is if it makes sense to call it without using its return value. Yes, very nice. Um, must oh, also apparently, if you define a variable within a function, it's not a pure function. Is that true? No. Um, <laughs> no, because that you can do that with discipline state. It's allowed. It's often okay. discouraged in functional programming. Um, saving something in a variable is like a, whoa, are we sure we need to do this <laughs> kind of thing in uh, MFP. But you are allowed to do it if it's tightly scoped to where it's being used. OK. Um, excellent. Very good summary. So no side effects. What is a side effect? This is open to anybody. Something that happens as a result of calling the function that's not actually returned from the function. Correct. So go back to this thing. That's a pure function. It doesn't affect anything else. It depends exclusively on its arguments and has a return value. It's not any less functional if I do something like, and then return the squared number. But you'll, note, you'll notice that in pure functions, like if you do use variables, it ends up kind of being like this. It's usually just to affect readability. It doesn't actually change the fundamental logic of it. Versus that, something not having a return value, that means that this is almost definitely impure. Because this dot number, wait, that's, that's over here. That's owned by this object. That's not owned by this function. This also impure because we're not relying exclusively on our arguments. We're required, we're expecting that this exists somewhere on the object that we're calling it on. That's called indirect input, not pure. Anything that prints something to the screen, like console.log, impure. That doesn't mean you can't do it. It means that like, that's not how we handle things in the functional paradigm. Um, depends only on those arguments, must return. So, uh, and this is where we get to, if you've seen the talking code question about what the difference between a procedure, a method, and a, uh, and a function. Let's see procedural add that's a side effect that's a procedure it is a repeated instruction to do something This is a function. Functions come from math. F of x, f of y of x, if you did calculus, all of that kind of stuff. This is the exact same idea there. We can chart all of the outputs for a domain of inputs. It's pure, it's wrapped together. That's a function. This is a method. A method operates, is, is a behavior on an object that operates on state. They look very similar, and you'll hear people use these interchangeably all the time, but they are technically three different things. That's a method. That's a function. This is a procedure.
Um, cool. Very good. Let's see. Uh, Ahmed and Victor, what were you guys talking about? We were talking about uh, first class and higher order functions. Yeah, what are those? First class function is also a function that does not have side effects, mm -hmm. but they are basically the main building blocks of the, of the code. They can be treated like values. So they're like the, yeah, like the main building blocks of mm -hmm. the code. I don't know what, how, how else to put it. Okay. It's a function that was built with the intention of being passed around to other functions. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so let's talk about these for just a sec before we talk about higher orders. Um, first class functions. Every time that I, you guys have done something where you have some element, add event listener, That's a we're using that handle thing is a first class function. You know, to save that in a variable like that, we could also do a declared function. Same thing. Could be a, a arrow function, whatever. The important thing about this is it's a variable, exactly like a boolean or a string or whatever else we can save it in variables we can pass it into things we can return it from things just a value by contrast that doesn't exist in ruby it kind of does there's procs uh but it's kind of a weak substitute honestly um because ruby doesn't have standalone functions that are all by themselves we can't save them as variables in things so in a language that has first class functions, we could do something like um, one, two, three dot map, where double is a function that just returns something times two. There's not a really good uh, equivalent to that in Ruby. In Ruby, we, we have to write that out as a block. Blocks are Ruby's way of dealing with the fact that they don't have first class functions. Now we can inline that function also in functional program that's called a lambda. Um, if I did it like but I'm taking advantage of first class functions if I'm saving it as a value, passing it around like that. You can also return things out of functions that are also functions. All that stuff is first class functions. Um, cool. Uh, Victor, what is a higher order function? So higher order functions would be those, would be like a map, dot map. So are the functions that take or return functions as arguments? That's it. Yeah. So takes a function, returns a function, or both. Those count as higher order functions. Um, so Victor is absolutely correct. Map is a higher order function because it takes a function as an argument. So is add event listener. I don't want to get too deep into the syntax on this, but uh, if we've talked about closures before, um, I might have talked to you about how you can um, you can uh, take something that takes two arguments as a function and split it into two functions that take one. So like some of you were doing things in your mod three code challenge where you do like um, uh, element add event listener.
where you were doing that because your event handler needed to have two arguments. So you made that a separate function, pass both of them in. Totally valid way to do that. The, and then, so then your sum handler then took in event and something else, and then you do whatever with it. The functional way to do that would be like this. Call that procedural. The functional way to do that same thing would be to have some handler take in only something else and then return a function that looks for an event. And then this becomes that. Take a second and just stare at that for a while. Cause like, this is getting a little bit 301, 401 with our JavaScript chops. But this is the use case for something returning a function. But see if you can wrap your head around that. I'm going to give you like a minute on this one because it's, it's heavy. So basically since like the event is implied in there, since the function is looking for an event, it's, it's like it's circling around and plugging that returned function in, in place there. Yeah, so when I invoke and it's handling some handler, I get back a function that's looking for an event. Turns out a function that's looking for an event is exactly what the second argument for add event listener should be. The reason that we wrapped it with this other thing has to do with something that we've been talking about a lot lately. Closure. Closure. Inside of this function, I have access to something else through closure. I have access to event because it's one of the parameters. I called some handler. It's done. It returned back this other function that remembers that it once knew of something called something else. So when you're defining that called back that returned function, how would you, how would you handle the something else portion of that? Or do you define that function within some handler? This, uh, yeah, so this is some handler and this function, it doesn't even have a name. It's an anonymous function. When I so call this, this one right here, what I'm getting back is this, but it can still see something else. But this particular function only takes an event. And you would just put inside that function event whatever you wanted to happen during click time? You got it. Or submit time? Yeah. Yeah, that's how you get two arguments into an event handler like that. You can do it like this, which is what most of you did in the code challenge. Totally fine. That's the procedural way to do it. The functional way to do it, we're always trying to break functions down to only have one argument or one parameter. That's how you do that with higher order functions. Um, cool, real quick. Uh, Lynn and Sanji, what did you guys find out? So type systems. Um, type systems are uh, logical systems that um, are a set of rules assigning a property um, or also called a type uh, to the various uh, things in a computer program, including variables, expressions, functions, and modules. The purpose of doing this is to reduce bugs by defining the things that need to interact together for the program to work and making sure that they are connected and hooked up in a consistent way. Um, and then, yeah, it just, it's to uh, reduce bugs. Excellent. Very good. We'll put a static analysis in there. So with a strong type system and hint, we're talking about them uh, during TypeScript today. 
uh, we can analyze if our program is going to break before we ever run it. I can take this add thing right here. And if I have types on those, and I do procedural add like that, that won't throw an error. That'll concatenate high in whatever number, whatever a number is. Womp womp, probably not what we're expecting. Um, meanwhile, if these had types like that, and it sees this in my code, it goes, eh, 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 eh. you're trying to pass a string somewhere that's expecting a number. Static analysis, before we even run the code, it'll tell us that it won't work. Okay, very nice. Um, Luis, what did you find out about referential transparency? Uh, referential transparency is when an expression can be replaced by its value without changing the result of the program. Uh, I think an example would be if you have a function that's adding to numbers and you replace one of the numbers with the variable, mm -hmm. um, you'll still get the same result. Very nice, very well put. An example of that, another one, right here. If the thing that I want to pass in is the second argument to add event listener is a function that accepts an event, well, calling some handler will give me a function that is looking for some event. So it's just like I typed out that thing in line. So the difference is that now I can see this other variable that I want it to be able to work with. Reference from transparency. Any place that I can use a three, I can also use that. If, if I had that in a function, any place I can use three, I can use the function call that returns three. Those things are exactly equivalent, which means we can do things like chain off of them. Um, so if that's looking for a get an array, if I call that, I can start getting indexes off that array right away because that's exactly the same as if I had that array. And try to get the second index of it. I can do a dot length, I can do a dot map. All those things get just interchangeable with each other. That's referential transparency. Cool. So that is our rough and tumble intro to functional programming. Hit me with some questions. So these principles are more like guidelines for best practice than they are like hard code, you have to do this. Uh, some of them are like, it depends on the language, because like in some of them, you don't have the option to make mutable variables. Like in a purely functional language, doing a side effect is difficult in Haskell. In a language like JavaScript, that's multi-paradigm. You say like, I am approaching this problem through a functional lens. But you can still like borrow a little bit from OOP if you want to. So they're kind of, these guidelines are kind of broad because of all the specifics in all the different functional languages? Mm -hmm. Okay. And it's, again, it's more of like an attitude that you're taking toward your code. Are you trying to treat this like math or are you trying to treat this like a story? That's functional versus OOP. Functional is what transformations are taking place. If I consider all these inputs that I get, users taking this action, a uh, user supplying me with this data, and I consider the outputs that I need, how do I transform those inputs into this output? That's a very mathy way of thinking of it. OOP is, all right, what are the nouns in this and how do they verb each other? Very literate uh, approach to this. Do you prefer functional programming? I do. I, I borrow a little bit from both, but 
in the 80-20 power law, I'm probably 80% functional. <clears throat> there are some things that are much more difficult to do with functional programming. Um, like, for example, you're making a video game. It is way easier to describe most video games in terms of nouns that verb each other. The hero shoots a bad guy and reduces their hit points to whatever else. Versus like, uh, I have a shot function that accepts uh, two characters um, and then like uh, goes, iterates to uh, an object that, or like a hash that they own that keeps track of their hit points. Or I pass a hit points like, um, a uh, number in, uh, and passed out into a, a reduce hit points function, which was passed into an alter state function. It gets a little bit harder to think of it that way. But for stuff like I've been talking about in some of those uh, talks I've been doing recently, like the data transformation stuff, there is nothing I like quite so much as a functional data transformation. So like in this talk, we were trying to like turn data that look like this into data that looks like this. You can do that with OOP and it sucks. Like trying to figure out what the nouns of these things are, trying to figure out what verbs you would use to describe this transformation. Fuck me, man, uh, that is hard. Meanwhile, doing that functionally, The result is all these little functions that just call other functions. Way easier. Other questions about paradigms, FP, and this stuff. Kind of curious, does Lodash make JavaScript more on the FP side or OOP? Way more FP. Okay. And in fact, the, um, the thing that I talked about in that talk was Lodash FP in particular, which is Lodash like that subscribes to FP concepts. Like there's there's some other things like fixed arity. That's like that's a very functional idea. Um, it's not like a core principle or anything, but the idea that nothing has a variable number of arguments, that's that's a functional idea. No optional arguments is also functional. But yeah, definitely leans that way. Anything else? Thank you. Have a good afternoon, everybody. Thank you.